Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar titled Ensuring Data Quality and Addressing Chromatographic Challenges in Routine Pharmaceutical Analysis Tools for Success. My name is Sim Price and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'm delighted to be joined by Heather Longdon and Dr. Paula Hong from Waters Corporation. Through our webinar, please feel free to ask questions for the Q&A session as well. You can, submit, you can submit these questions by the chat icon on the left side of your screen. Without further delay, let's begin today's presentation. Thanks ever so much, Finn. Uh, yes, my name is Heather Longdon. I work at Waters. And I'm part of the pharmaceutical marketing team. And we're going to look today at the challenges of chromatographic analyses, specifically in light of the challenges that are related to data integrity concerns, um, and hopefully provide some solutions and ideas of how to, to mitigate those things. Whenever I'm talking about data integrity, I do like to always start with the fact that data integrity is more than just about your computer software. Um, obviously, laboratory software needs to have the controls and technical uh, controls in place and the ability to manage people's use of the data and creation of the data, things like audit trails. But equally, we need to have robust processes in our IT department to make sure that data is stored securely in a central location, that networks are qualified, that there is a disaster recovery plan, we know how to work when the system is not running, and we can archive data into a long-term format. I like as well as to talk a lot about the people part of this, the making sure that everybody has training, everybody has unique accounts, and there's a good quality oversight process looking at what the people in the lab are doing. But today we're going to focus a lot on the quality separations aspect. How do we make sure that the data that we're creating on the instrument, on the chromatographic instrument, is deemed accurate and that our separation needs are assured. High quality reagents and columns are coupled with high performance chromatographic systems which are well maintained, calibrated and qualified. These assure there are fewer analysis failures which need to be investigated and potentially repeated. This, these specific attributes are often referred to as data quality but potentially both data quality and data integrity terms could be used, as we will examine today. The typical signals or signs that people are using to question or challenge data integrity are shown here. A big area of concern is about incomplete or, or really, do we have complete data? Are, is there results that haven't been reviewed or signed off? Equally, you'll hear an awful lot about suspect data data that is uh, that maybe takes uh, the need of manual and analyst manual intervention to get correct and you'll also hear an awful lot about audit trails and the review of those audit trails but today i'm going to focus really on that suspect data so this is data that passes the spec that's very close strange peak codes unusual peak integration which is always a big topic data that's been processed many times or manually integrated um, or has very complex integration parameters um, so that's really the root cause of why people need to intervene with those is really down to the methods that we are using, um, particularly when we're using older methods or monograph chromatographic methods. So just as a bit of fun, we thought we'd ask you a quick poll. If you had this group of peaks in one of your pharmaceutical um, methods, which would you suggest would be the correct or the right way to do the peak integration? Would you select A, would you select B, would you select C, or would you select D? And this is a question I ask to an awful lot of people when I'm using this presentation. So maybe if you've been on one of my presentations before, you've been answered this in a previous in a previous step, a previous occasion. I just give everybody a few minutes to select from the poll which one they would like. I'm just going to try and refresh this so I can read this. Okay, working today. Okay, so we had uh, we had a uh, ten uh, percent of people selected A, thirty percent selected B. We had uh, a few people selected C and the majority of people selected D, and that reflects exactly what I always get as a as a grouping of how those particular choices go. Now, my first answer is 
if I had this method, I would want to do everything I possibly could to make sure those peaks were, were pulled apart because when they're baseline resolved, then we can get accurate peak integration and we're not doing an estimate. Using tools like dropping uh, perpendiculars or skims are always only going to give us an estimate. So we're really only going to get proper, consistent, accurate quantitation when the peaks are baseline resolved. The second thing I always say is, well, how was it validated? When the method was validated, how was the integration done? What instructions? Did you put a picture in the instructions of the SAP to say, please integrate these peaks like, here, like this? Not the actual outcome, or the parameters rather, but the actual outcome. This is the type of integration I want. Another point is which peak you're interested in, because in all four cases, the last peak is actually integrated pretty much identically. If I look at these, these uh, solutions or these integrations, you can see that C is the only one that has actually picked up the tiny shoulder on, that, on the back edge of that first peak. But the integration of that impurity is way overestimated. So I would be overestimating there the, the integration or the quantity of that impurity. And D is the one that's always the most popular because it is easy. It's robust. It doesn't vary. It's just going to look for the, for, the, for the valleys and it's going to join the integration there. But you can see that there's already a, a large area underneath those first, two, um, first three peaks that's not included in any of the impurities. And so I, we always say this is going to always underestimate if you use a valley to valley integration. Um, and if those peaks get closer together, then that valley becomes much higher and you're going to exclude and ignore a whole lot more of the area. So I always always look to A and B as being probably the most easiest one to consistently integrate. And for me, the area of that first uh, impurity, if that's what I'm most in, uh, um, concerned about, is probably more accurately integrated in A than in B. So that that just that runs us through those, and I think if we, when we look in the next few slides, we're going to see here that some of the regulatory observations are starting to question this kind of inter peak integration. This is from an observation earlier this year, which specifically pulled out peak integration. It said your test methods were not capable of demonstrating purity. Your data was reprocessed multiple times, and we only included the final results. So that's the complete aspect. We only looked at the final result. Um, and then it said it's common practice to play with the parameters. Now, that's a bad use of words, but we all will, will recognize that in order to get good peak integration, we do need to optimize the parameters. It's pretty common practice. It's just an unfortunate way of using those words. But if we look at the detail, we can see that there was a tail, just like in, a peak on the tail, just like in my example, and that was integrated differently prior to a certain date than it was afterwards. And even after then, it was not always followed and consistently integrated. And if we look at the very last sentence, it says the SOP recommends valley to valley integration, which is what we just looked at as option D. But when they're not baseline resolved, the integration lessens the level of the impurity. And that was just what I was saying there, that when we use valley to valley, we are actually going to exclude some of the response of that peak in integration. So it is important to understand the consequences of using different types of integration. There's been multiple other instances of this over the over the last year or so. Here we're saying um, the manipulation and changing the data, changing the integration parameters means that previously resolved peaks would not be integrated and included in the calculation. This next example here talks about the lack of peak resolution and having a procedure for doing the integration. And this last example also says there's multiple examples of the failure to properly integrate closely eluting or co-eluting peaks, um, which means that you're going to uh, be difficult to detect and measure the impurities because of inadequate integration or inadequate analytical methods. So really here, it sort of, you looked at these as a data integrity issue, but it's really to do with the robustness of the method and the analytical method and what can we do to make life easier for analysts. And let's be realistic. This is not this is fairly uh, typical that we do find, especially among older methods. We can see very unusual peaks. This is actually a blank, believe it or not, of a particular assay from a from a monograph. And we can see that if uh, we add an overlay of the actual sample, you know that's not the very clear example of very nice baseline resolved, no drifted kind of chromatograms that we see in textbooks. 
and that potentially a quality unit would be expected to see. In some cases, this could be the reality of everyday peak integration. It's not easy to set up integration parameters that would be able to integrate that blue chromatogram correctly, reproducibly, consistently every day. Another interesting fact is if you look in the beginning, middle of that rising baseline, there are three peaks that showed up in the blanks, some tiny little peaks, and they show up exactly the same in the sample. It's pretty obvious, therefore, that those are coming from something to do with the mobile phase or the injection or something not related to the sample. So it's correct that we don't want to include that in any calculations of impurities. And typically what people would do would be to ignore that. They would put an inhibit integrate around that peak or, or set it in such a way that it would not integrate those peaks. But now that's setting off alarm bells. How do you know that's really a system peak and it isn't some impurity that you are now ignoring? So listening to those concerns, in an earlier version of our Empower software, we allowed people to designate those different peaks and say, this is an impurity peak, this is a main assay peak, and you would do the appropriate calculations on those. But you can also designate, this is a diluent peak, this is a system peak, and then in the calculations, exclude those from the calculations. They are integrated, but they're labeled with a cord to your SOP for how those, uh, how those should be included or not included in calculations. Another uh, tool that you have in your arsenal when you're looking at am I integrating peaks correctly is to use uh, something like the photodiode array detector. Because when we have a photodiode array detector, we can look at how the spectra change across a peak. And that will tell us if our peak integration is actually create, uh, integrating the error from one component or whether potentially there could be another component with a different spectra that's part contributing to the area of that peak. And in this occasion, although the integration looks very nice on the, on the top part of it, if we, look, if we look at the purity plot, we'll see that the angle is bigger than the threshold. And you'll see in, in that exploded diagram that the green line, which is the, the spectral um, homogeneity across the peak, is above a threshold at the end. That's because that bigger peak is bleeding underneath and contributing to some of the area of this peak. So we could use that to say, well, maybe this isn't the right in integration for this peak. Maybe there's a slightly different way we can get a better estimate if, if we can't pull apart that impurity from the main peak in the injection. So you can see that a lot of times when we talk about data integrity, the concerns about the analyst intervening, when you actually look at the methods that the analyst is trying to work with, you can see that they're struggling and they need those tools like to be able to integrate or reintegrate or adjust the parameters and optimize integration to get the most accurate and consistent integration. And a lot of times the reason they're struggling is because the method is either very old, it's never been modernized, it was developed a long time ago in the development process or the research area and not, isn't really suitable for use in an analytical routine laboratory. So I look at data integrity and they move sort of foot in the industry at the moment about method modernization, about method lifecycle management, and think that those two things together can do complement each other. That if we can improve the methods and we can do it in a way that's not too burdensome, then we should be able to reduce the manual manipulation that analysts need to do and reduce the concerns of the quality units or the regulators about data integrity problems. Obviously, things about improving methods, we want, if we can improve sensitivity, we can see compounds at lower levels. For this particular topic, what we're really trying to do is increase robustness so that we don't have to keep optimizing parameters or integration parameters, which will reduce the number of abnormal results or investigations that come up because the methods of method issues that then have to be investigated by the quality unit. We want to have fit for purpose methods. One thing we're looking at here is trying to combine assay and impurity assays into one analysis. Why do I need to do two injections? If I've got a sensitive enough equipment, can I not do them both together? Can we add orthogonal detectors like PDAs or even mass specs to help to offer more information about unknown peaks? And can we start to look for potential impurities, not just the ones that we, we know about and have seen there? Also, if we can do the calculations automatically, people in the lab can understand whether if data is normal or not normal long before it gets into a limb system, for instance. 
But we need that courage because changing methods can be difficult. People are concerned about changing methods. It's seen as risky. What do we do about all the tests we did up till now? Can I change the analytical method in the middle of a stability test? What happens if a new peak shows up, which is the one thing I hear an awful lot about when I question people and say, could you not make this method better? They say, but what if a new peak shows up? I always say, what would happen if, it, if you didn't know about a new compound that showed up in your chromatogram? That's much more worrying to me. And there's also the registration aspect, where analytical methods are registered in many regulators across the world, as well as validating the new method, they have to consider the cost of registering a new method. And that's really why we're very pleased to see that there are moves in the industry across the world and globally through the uh, harmonization in the ICH to look at a product life cycle approach. And they're really looking at also uh, analytical methods. So Annex 2 of the ICHQ12 that was released in December talks specifically about how can you make changes to a method and not require pre-approval from a, an agency. And it's really all about documenting your method knowledge. Um, and following on from ICHQ12, we've also got a second group. They're looking at analytical method development and creating a new guidance about analytical method development, which will include putting a lot more information uh, into the submission about your analytical methods and then that will also go back and look at ICHQ2 which is the method validation guidance and apply those similar principles to, to that part as well. If you have not heard of this of these uh, initiatives just if you go to the waters uh, www.methods.waters.com there's an awful lot of information about what's happening in this area. When we look at robustness and system suitability, today we often think about method development is really about scouting and optimization. And a lot of the work about how good a method is done is done by the method validation process. So under those current ICH guidance, that's, that's how it's kind of split up. So accuracy, precision, system suitability is part of validation. But I believe that with this move to a, a method lifecycle approach, we're going to see that analytical target profile develop and our stage one, our method development, design and, de um, and design and development, is going to include an awful lot more information about not just scouting and optimization, but also robustness. Potentially, how easy it is to transfer a method between instruments? Does that work very well? Or is this method very, very sensitive to a particular kind of instrument or a particular kind of column? And I think as well, the system stability tests, which are related to the analytical target profile, really are going to contribute in that very early stage, in stage one of method life cycle, and contribute to the method knowledge documentation that will potentially be part of your regulatory submission. So I'm looking at the changes in this new approach and thinking, we want to be thinking about the life of this method, where it's going to be in the future, much earlier before we start to validate it and be sure that it's going to be fit for purpose going forwards. We've seen as well the regulators are looking at system suitability and all of these observations come from April this year where regulators were in inspections and started to look at people saying, well, your system suitability didn't detect your system was, was not suitable uh, or you haven't done the testing to ensure your equipment is suitable. The system suitability isn't always rerun when, an al when a run is aborted. And the, the, there's a very nice observation where they talk about they're not, not completing the system stability, they actually describe what the purpose of system stability testing is, in that it is something to prove that the analytical instrument is fit for intended purpose before you analyze samples. And we have a lot of cases where people just run system suitability and the samples, and then they go back to worry about whether the system was suitable. I think we don't want to have samples passing when an instrument is not working properly. And actually, I would not put it, even put the samples on to run if I didn't think the system was working properly. So we have a quick poll now, poll number two, which is in your laboratory, how many sample sets per week or on average may need to be invalidated and repeated because the system suitability test failed? Is there not really ever? That doesn't really occur. Is it one to three per week, uh, between three and 10 sample sets a week, or more than 10? And obviously, this is going to depend on the size of your lab uh, as well. If you've got a lab with, with 60 people in it, then it's going to have a higher number, or 60 instruments, it's going to have a higher number that maybe need to be invalidated.
Okay, so I think probably that's uh, everybody's had a chance to to select those. I don't see those quite yet. Oh, here we are. Um, so yeah, we've got a number of people said yeah, we don't have that at all. But you know, there's only ten percent really that say that doesn't happen at all. Um, 30% say it just happens one to three times a week. We, we've got uh, a few people who said that it happens more than that. And a D, actually quite a lot. 60% of people said it happens more than 10 times a week that the system suitability fails. And that's, that creates a big headache because we have a whole bunch of results. We've ran samples, we've done testing, and then we find out we have to invalidate that data and repeat it. And that's a big area of concern. So having robust methods that run on high performance systems so that system suitability won't fail is pretty important. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Paula and she's going to talk to us a bit about how we can get better reproducibility, accuracy and precision on instruments. Thanks Heather for the great overview on data integrity. So let's turn our attention to how we can improve chromatographic performance, specifically with respect to reproducibility, reliability, accuracy and precision. These are key measurements of a quality separation. But before we get into chromatography, I want to review Water's Core Liquid or LC portfolio. In addition to the Alliance and the Acuity ARC, we recently introduced a new LC to our portfolio. The ARC HPLC complements both our Alliance and Acuity ARC products by offering an additional alternative for routine analyses. For those of you familiar with Water's portfolio, you will know that both the Alliance and the ARC are quaternary systems, each with its own benefit. The ARC HPLC provides the ability to run routine methods that may be developed on higher pressure Acuity ARC systems while providing the same or superior injection precision. In addition, the higher pressure range of the ARC HPLC combined with the use of small 3.5 micron columns can provide greater resolution and efficiency of separations. The system is designed to be used with high salt mobile phases that are typical of many routine assays and include robust HPLC mixtures and compatible tubing. In summary, the H ARC HPLC offers a high performance instrument for challenging HPLC system separations. Oh, Paul, so what, what, we've got this, if I've got this new instrument that we want to bring into the lab, I guess the first thing people are going to ask is, so how do I know that this new instrument is going to run all my methods that I know work on the instruments I already have in the lab? That's so, method transfer that we want to do. Yep, so that's method transfer. Method transfer is when we keep the column and the method conditions the same with no changes um, and try to transfer them to um, other systems. So that actually brings us to our next poll question. When transferring methods into the QC lab, do you typically keep the column and method conditions the same and demonstrate the same relative retention times? Do you keep the column and method conditions the same but adjust the gradient or injection timings to deliver identical retention times? Another option is to take the opportunity to modernize your method by making column and method challenges within allowable adjustments as by a regulatory agency with appropriate verification. Or the last option is would you routinely redevelop the method on the receiving system to achieve optimal performance with full method validation? So there's a wide, actually all of the answers have been, um, some people have selected all of the answers, but in general, um, most of you keep your method and column conditions the same and use relative retention time. That's at 45 point, 45%. So that's not really surprising. We know that many um, USP monographs, as well as many methods, specify relative retention times as a criteria instead of retention times for the very reason that different methods might result in shifts due to gradient delay. But let's look at an example that we ran in our laboratories here at Waters, transferring a method across the Alliance, Acuity ARC, and ARC HPLC system. So ideally, we want to get the same results on our LC separation, regardless of the HPLC system. Here we can see that we do get comparable separation and peak retention times. 
and the separation of an active pharmaceutical ingredient and related impurities. As Heather discussed earlier, the point in the method development process at which transfers are evaluated can help provide a more robust method. So if we do these studies earlier in our method development process, um, that can ensure that we will not have to troubleshoot any type of method transfer later on in our process. But if we look at the results specifically in a little more detail, we can see that how we judge or the system suitability for our method can impact the transferability. So as we talked about earlier, if we use relative retention time as a criteria for our method, these would be comparable across all of the methods. This data is not shown, but we can see that other criteria such as percent RSDs of retention time and area and resolution are all comparable. In addition, if we look at the repeatability of the method, um, specifically with re reference to RSDs of peak area, we can see that the ARC HPLC gives very low values of 0.28%, less than the typical USB specification of 2.0%. But what I really want to highlight here is the box in red, which shows the USP resolution values between all the peaks on the comparable systems. This is obviously peaks five and six are the critical pair that we saw on the earlier slide. And you can see here that in our method transfer example, we got no degradation of that critical peak resolution. So we were able to successfully transfer across all of the systems. So that was great. So I can be confident that any old methods that I have on my traditional HPLC systems are gonna run the same on a higher performance system like the ARC HPLC, whether it's a monograph or my validated method. But if I've got concerns about the analysts having to manually integrate or to manually change, optimize the integration, what can a lab, lab practically do to improve the chromatographic methods? Sometimes those methods are old. They've got large particle sizes or very long columns. Some labs have adopted uh, the dramatic improvements that UPSC can provide to speed up methods and improve resolution and sensitivity. But in many companies, HPLC is still the technique of choice for a wide variety of reasons. But even here, is there anything we can do with short columns or small particle sizes to leverage to improve the separation? How does that work, Paula? Well, if we think about approving a method from a data integrity standpoint, a key component is improving resolution, especially for critical pairs, as we saw in the earlier example. To do that, we can evaluate or consider the resolution equation, which has three components, efficiency, selectivity, and retentivity. While selectivity and retentivity can have a significant impact, these are typically adjusted or modified in method development. But if we think about transferring or scaling a method, we can impact resolution with efficiency. So this is, um, efficiency is largely impacted by the physical parameters, such as the size of the particles and the types of the instruments that are used. Many of you may have already seen this plot before, but this shows the impact of flow rate on the efficiency or plate count of different particle size columns. What we are looking at specifically is 2.1 by 50 millimeter columns, all packed with different particle sizes from 1.7 to 5 micron, run on a UPLC or low dispersion system. As you can see, the smaller particles lead to an increased efficiency across the flow rate range, hence providing more resolving power. However, something to remember here is that the columns with smaller particles do produce higher back pressure and need a low dispersion system to achieve that optimal efficiency. What this means is that HPLC systems will not really provide the highest resolving power or may not be able to run small sub-2 micron particles. But what does that mean for our separation? Well, we can take advantage of smaller particles by keeping the L over DP or length versus particle size ratio constant. This is a measure of the resolving power of the column. Looking at the following chart, we can see that the column length will decrease as the particle size is lower if we want to maintain the L over DP. So looking at the orange boxes, we started with a 4.6 by 155 micron column in our initial separation. Method transfer across equivalent resolving power columns would include a 3.5 micron 100 millimeter column or 2.575 millimeter column. 
Remembering that the column also needs to be compatible with our systems, lower particle sizes, such as 1.7, may not be suitable for the HPLC systems. In general, the strategy of keeping the L over DP, or efficiency equivalent, will also reduce solvent consumption and time of the analysis. In this specific example, we will at minimum keep our resolution the same and may see some slight improvements. But if we want to improve the separation significantly, we could also increase the efficiency, something that is more possible with lower particle size columns, as we have many more options. So we know there are limitations, but can people take advantage of modern HPLCs to run faster separations without redeveloping the method completely? Can we use that theory about L over DP to get the same separations, but faster? Um, yes, we can by scaling the method. So this is the original method up top that we showed earlier on our RKHPLC. And we can move the co method and column from a 5 micron to a 3.5 micron column on the ARC HPLC, keeping the L over DP essentially constant. So we just reduce the particle size and shorten the column length. In this example, we can see by taking advantage of the lower particle size, we can produce an analysis with shorter runtime and lower solvent consumption. The challenge is that the separation on a 3.5 micron also produces higher back pressure. So while it can run on an ARC HPLC, it may not be able to be performed on lower pressure HPLC systems. In addition, we should note that the resolution of the critical pair showed some improvement in well, as well. This wasn't really expected, but it was a bonus for this separation. On a traditional HPLC, you probably would have been forced to reduce the flow rate to keep within pressure tolerances. So that's great. That got some improvement between that critical pair, but do you have an example of how you can use the theory with a modern HPLC and get an even better separation? One that I don't have to manually integrate those peaks or that people will routinely be able to get it integrated right first time. And that might need revalidation, I guess. Yep, so if we, keep, if we think about the L over DP, going back to the table we saw previously, many regulatory agencies allow some adjustment for L over DP or efficiency of the column. For example, the USP 621 has a guideline of keeping the L over DP within a minus 25 to plus 50 percent. If we apply these same principles to our initial separation, which as I showed earlier was on a 4.6 by 155 micron column, we can see that there are two options for the 3.5 micron column. The first option, which we showed previously, is using a 100 millimeter length column, keeping the L over DP comparable. However, we also have the option to use the same column dimensions with a 3.5 micron column as used initially with the 5 micron. So a 4.6 by 150, 3.5 micron column. This keeps the L over DP higher, but within the plus 50% limit. So these are the results. And when we scale our column um, from a 5 to a 3.5 micron column, keeping all of the conditions identical. Here you can see the chromatographic separation and the bar chart show improved USP resolution between all of the peaks, including for that critical pair, which almost doubled. The chromatograms look identical, except for the increased resolution, and we also get an increased peak response. However, our pressure has gone up significantly to 8,000 PSI, so the system choices also become limited. This separation can be formed on an ARC HPLC because of its higher back pressure requirements or tolerance, but the method would need to be revalidated. Um, but we have shown significant improvement in our method and improved data quality, making integration of the critical pair easier. So in those earlier examples, that method, that method that you were showing was a gradient method. And even though I've got much better resolution, I have to still even I still have to revalidate that method because it's a gradient, right? But I was reading about that that um, ICSQ12, which has that interesting annex specifically about letting analysts and scientists improve their methods without requiring pre-approval changes to their regulated licenses. But there are still rules about allowable changes without a full revalidation. And I guess that's why we would still need to validate that change, even though it's much better method now. 
Yeah, so there are, um, as we talked about earlier, for gradient methods, any changes would require a revalidation. But I do also want to talk about the fact that there are some parameters, specifically with regard to isocratic separations, that the USP currently does allow for guidelines or adjustments. Um, this gives us more flexibility than gradient methods. Um, and as we talked about earlier, it allows for adjustments of the column efficiency, minus 25 to plus 50%. And the flow rate and injection volume would then also be scaled. However, with these allowable changes, a full validation wouldn't be required, but verification would be based on your assay and the critical parameters. So what does that look like? Well, let's take a look at a USP monograph for Lysartan potassium. The system suitability requirements include column efficiency, USP tailing, and relative standard de deviation of not more than 0.5% for peak area, which is significantly lower than many other monographs, and it's actually fairly tight system suitability criteria. The original method actually specified a 4 millimeter by 250 millimeter 5 micron column, which is actually not available in any modern chemistries. So we actually scaled it to a 4.6 by 255 micron on the ARC HPLC. And we were able to meet all of the system suitability and got a very low percent RSD of area with 0. less than 0.08%. 9%. Per the USP guidelines, the method was also scalable to a 4.6 by 253.5 micron column with adjustments to flow rate and injection volume. The resulting separation produces improvement in column efficiency and lower percent RSD for area on the ARC HPLC. This is, of course, accompanied with higher back pressure, which makes this method incompatible with lower pressure systems. But on the ARC HPLC, this method met all system suitability criteria, including injection precision, column efficiency, with both types of columns. So, as we described, while gradient methods today are not scalable at this point in time, it's important to note that there are updates in discussion, as shown here. If you can, if you can read the, the picture here. Um, the changes proposed to 621 have been, uh, been in the air for a really long time. And that we're, to be able to do those adjustments um, should allow much greater flexibility. Verification would need to be performed, but potentially not full validation, even if it was a gradient method. So we're, the changes are an effort to harmonize the USP and the EP and the JP. But the global agreement has once again stalled. We were very close and we were expecting these changes to happen this, this fall. But it's again stalled and won't likely be resolved until at least 2021. But the good news is that we are assured that the change, uh, chapter 12, 1220, the analytical procedure lifecycle chapter, and the 1469 nitrosamine chapter, which I know everybody is interested in looking for, will be available in the September issue of the USP. So do watch out for a Waters webinar about those updates in the fall. So the, we've seen a couple of nice stories about peak resolution, but what about the other four, or what about the other performance attributes? Um, I've mentioned earlier that regulators have concerns about failing system suitability tests. Analysts are always worried that when a system suitability test fails, they don't only have to repeat the run, but there's a whole bunch of documentation and paperwork to do as well. So does the RKHPLC offer any benefits for factors like uh, injection precision, retention time repeatability? What about gradient performance? RKHPLC, I believe, is a quaternary pump. Does that mean it doesn't perform as well as a binary pump? So regardless of what system we're going to look at, we really need to think about the system as a whole and review the key method parameters. Many of these methods that we run routinely can have very challenging conditions. Um, and these results can be impacted by different components of the system or the instrument. For example, we know that the design of the pump, whether binary or quaternary, can impact the gradient delay of the methods, as shown in the bottom of the slide where we've highlighted what the gradient delay encompasses. These can result in transfer and resulting in a retention time shift across the systems. Other considerations may include the temperature of the column, sensitivity, flow rate, and gradient slope. However, many methods, even those with challenging conditions, can be run successfully on many instruments. So let's take a look at an example where we transferred a very fast gradient performed on a binary HPLC to our ARC HPLC. 
Here we observed good repeatability for each method on the, both systems. To ensure the gradient delay did not impact the separation, in this example, we used gradient smart start to adjust the start of the gradient relative to the injection time. While this did not alter the gradient start, um, it, it did ensure retention times were met, um, and it may require some verification. However, as many of you described earlier, if you do use relative retention times as your criteria, no adjustments would have needed to be made to the method and system suitability would have been met. But looking at some more results in detail, we can see that both the binary and quaternary pumps performed well in terms of repeatability, an important system suitability criteria. The retention time RSD on both systems produced values of less than 0.25. In peak area, we can see that the ARC HPLC outperforms the binary HPLC with significantly lower percent RSD for replicate injections. The results on the ARC HPLC were less than 0.2, while the binary HPLC had higher values. But both systems performed well for this assay, and method transfer would have been successfully um, accomplished. But that's an example of a very fast gradient, and many of our routine methods are really not under those conditions. So let's look at a more typical method that we may run in our lab. And this is a typical USP monograph, specifically for azithromycin. Challenges of this method include a very long shallow gradient with a 5% change in gradient over 25 minutes. Um, the, the conditions also require monitoring the absorbance at a very low wavelength of 210 and a high column temperature. Furthermore, the mobile phase A contains phosphate buffer, which is part of a gradient with acetonitrile methanol. The gradient conditions also result in the possibility that salts in the mobile phase A may precipitate at high organic or percent B if mixing is not adequate. If we look at the performance on the ARC HPLC on the right, we can see that the azithromycin sample shows good repeatability of five replicate injections, or six replicate injections. In addition, um, the data does, isn't shown, but both the standard and the system suitability sample all met USP system suitability requirements. But let's look at the same criteria for the method as we did in the fast gradient. If we look more closely at some of the impurity methods selected throughout the gradient, we can see good retention time repeatability. The percent RSG for all the six peaks throughout the chromatogram are less than 0.4. For the peak area, we're only going to focus on those peaks that are above 0.2% and or would need to be reported. Again, all of the peaks have percent RSGs less than 2%, well within the specifications for low-level impurities. This shows the ability of the ARC HPLC to reproducibly deliver this gradient and provide good injection precision. So over to you, Heather. Thanks. So you can see there that high quality separations with maximum resolution, they should allow lab staff to more often get the right integration first time and minimize the need to invalidate results and reprocess data. The major focus of the regulator today is about this idea of testing into compliance, which broadly means simply rerunning and reprocessing samples until you get the answers you want, and then only reporting the good results. Runs that should never be repeated before a documented investigation and scientific invalidation process, which has identified a root cause. This is a time consuming and often valueless exercise, but it's absolutely required before any repeat runs can be made and used. Water's reputation for performance in equipment, chemistries, and services um, is critical in ensuring that analysis don't fail the system suitability checks, which may then require samples to be invalidated and repeated. One critical aspect that I think people forget, as well as the services and the robustness of the instrument, is the materials that you're actually using for doing the system suitability readiness testing. Too many labs have tried to explain away unofficial sample pre-testing or previewing and calling them test injections or trial injections, which has caused a whole bunch of worries in the regulators. The scientists among us know that actually running a couple of injections to make sure a system is working correctly is really absolutely a requirement before we even start and think about putting on our system suitability test, just to be sure that systems are properly equilibrated. But if you could use a truly independent uh, standard for that, uh, a benchmarking kind of standard, that would assure quality assurance or anybody else looking at the data that you weren't 
trying to preview and testing your samples under the guise of calling it system suitability testing. So one of the things that at Waters we do is we've developed these QCRM independent benchmarking standards and there's one that's very similar to the analytical test we saw at the beginning. It has a critical pair in it, it's used for reverse phase chromatography and has a very critical pair that are very close. So using some independent standard like this as part of your system suitability tests rather than running your uh, a sample or, or which would be really uh, really not um, not recommended or even one of your standards could be questioned. Running something truly independent should make sure that this, is, this data can be accepted. And if it's not reverse phase chromatography, there are QCRM standards for polars, neutrals, or and some specifically created for use with, a, with an MS detector like a QDA. So while you typically hear about software or IT and validation when we're talking about data integrity, it's important to really think about how people are part of that process and their training and their knowledge. And could they be introduced, the use of the people be introducing unintended bias? By automating as much of the data creation process as possible, we should be able to truly trust the data and minimize the effort in generating and reviewing lab results. However, in order for data to be deemed accurate, the quality of the separation needs to be assured. High quality reagents and columns coupled with high performance instruments which are well maintained, calibrated and qualified assure fewer analysis failures which need to then be investigated and potentially repeated. This is where an assessment of your HPLC fleet might highlight where older traditional LCs are contributing to the number of failed system suitability tests. And just as we finish, we're gonna ask you one last poll question if you wouldn't be, um, uh, if you could possibly just pick up on the screen and just select which two of these would, would trigger you to think about replacement of your HPLC system. Uh, just any generally systems that are greater than seven years old. If you've had, if experienced issues with these systems to be able to achieve system suitability criteria, that would be answer B. Whether there's limited or discontinued vent support, I know that can be a driver for changing and updating instruments. There's just new technology which you would really like to take advantage of. Or is there some reason about the older instruments that there's limited software upgrades due to some incompatibility with maybe your CDS that you're using? So if you've, everybody's got a chance to pick on those. Okay, that would be great. So we can now move on to the question and answer portion of this of this webinar. And I'm sure there's plenty of questions that people have thought of as they've gone through this, the uh, listening to all this scientific discussion, as well as talking about data integrity. Great, fantastic. Thank you both for the presentation. Uh, first of all, let me thank you all in the audience for taking part and answering the poll questions. Uh, and now let's move on to the Q&A session. So the first question that we have is, how can you change timing in the instrument to get the same retention times of different systems? Can you explain a bit more about gradient smart? So I'll take this. Um, so there are two ways you can um, adjust the timing of the instrument or the gradient. Obviously, this only applies to gradient methods of the retention time. So you can add um, or adjust your initial hold. Um, for that reason, it is much easier to change a hold that you already have in your method. For that reason, it is generally recommended when you do develop a method to have an initial isocratic hold because modifying it um, is allowable. And then you can just use um, you may have to re-verify your method. But the other option we have on some of our instruments is Gradient Smart Start, which is allows you to adjust the gradient start relative to the injection. Um, again, this would also require verification, but the nice thing about this tool is, is it can actually help you also troubleshoot what may be happening or what problems you may have in your method transfer. So you can um, use this tool to kind of figure out if that's what's impacting the retention time differences across the two instruments or if there's something else. 
Great. Thanks very much for that answer. Um, next up, we have uh, in-system suitability parameters uh, not achieved the resolution, then what would we do? Uh, sorry, let me rephrase yeah. that. Uh, in-system suitability parameters, if we don't achieve the resolution, then what should we do? I, from my view, I think the resolution criteria really affects the ability to, to do a good and reproducible injection. But I know that there's many, many methods, especially impurity methods or related substances, as they're sometimes called, where the peaks are just are not resolved and they've been validated in a, in, with a method where they, where they aren't, where they're not resolved. Um, yeah, if your method is described to the analyst exactly how to integrate peaks that are not resolved, um, then you've actually worked on, you've worked out how to use that estimate and worked out that that estimate is consistent and that data can be accepted. But if your systems are running, if your uh, resolution limits are not being met, then that system has failed to do the separation it's meant to do. And if it, your rep, you, you've got a limit of 1.7, like we had in that earliest example, and you don't have a resolution of 1.7, then your accuracy of doing the calculation of that impurity in that product is not being met. And that would need to be investigated about why it's not happening. Is it the wrong column? Did you use the wrong mobile phase? Was it a mistake of the lab person? And when you find out the root cause of why that's not met is resolution criteria, only then can you repeat the run. And probably you'd need to use a different column or make some adjustments to the system to, to, to correct that whatever error had happened before. Thank you. Uh, next up we have, in general, what are the system suitability parameters normally required for related substance tests? So I'm I can, sure <laughs> I can one. start so I'm with, with, with you know, that's fine. So um, there are typically um, uh, repeatability or, or RSG requirements for all methods. Um, and if they're not specified within the monograph, they are specified within 621. So there are certain RSG specifications that you may need to, to meet. The other thing is it will vary. So there may be a resolution requirement or it may be an efficiency requirement. Generally, um, a related substance or impurities method will have some type of system suitability sample that will have a uh, resolution between two of the analytes. But again, those won't be all the analytes you see in your formulation or in your sample. But so there generally will be a USP resolution requirement for one critical pair and system suitability and perhaps tailing is a big one as well. But again, it will slightly vary from method to method. And I guess sometimes older monographs don't have those in at all. Uh, and you, know, you could look at that and say, well, why do I need to measure it? Well, even if you if it's not required by the monograph, it's still a really good idea to to make sure that you have these peaks well resolved and that you can integrate them consistently. So I would think of putting those limits in anyway, even if they're not in the monograph. Thank you both. Uh, next we have. What is my incentive uh, for improving any of my methods if I have to do all the validation and documentation for it? Yeah, validation and documentation is real hard. <laughs> um, but it's not as difficult as it used to be. Um, when I, I remember when I worked in the lab, you know, doing a validation of a method could have taken two or three weeks or so because I had to run so many samples for all the different tests that need to be done. Uh, and I would be doing the linearity and then I would go on to the next test and then I would go on to the next test. A couple of things have changed in that time to really reduce that. One is that the run times, if you've improved the method from a 25 minute run time to a five minute run time, actually running all those samples is going to be way faster. So the actual work in the lab is going to be much reduced. And then on top of that, a lot of the software now that you can use, um, like the Empower uh, Method Validation Manager, will use injections that you've created for doing, say, linearity, and it will use some of those injections in the precision test, so it will uh, there's some overlap, and so you're not running exactly as many samples. Uh, obviously, you need to do all the calculations and the reporting of it, but so there is still effort involved in it. The trick, I think, is to think about what am I going to gain? What can I get back if I do all this work to, to redevelop the method, I validate the method, 
and I use the new method, will I get back time savings? Will I get back consistency and quality of the data? Will I be able to integrate things right first time and not have to fail system suitability tests? and then repeat them and document all of that. If you look at all the work that you're doing, because because of the poor method that you have or the older method that you have, what could you gain at the end of it if you just take the time and the effort to do that revalidation exercise? And so that's something I think everyone's gonna look at their own methods and if they've got troublesome methods, they're the ones to think about, I could actually get something back from that if I do the work of redeveloping and validating it. That's a really good question. Yeah, a little bit of a dilemma, that one. Uh, next up we have, uh, if I have to validate the method, why shouldn't I go to a UHPLC method rather than sticking with my HPLC? Okay, I can I can talk to that one as well, a little bit as well. But Paul, did you have something you wanted to say first? I was just going to say it may depend on the instrumentation that you have in your in your laboratory. But Heather, I know you have a lot more insight into this. Yeah, I, I, you know, we talked in one of the poll questions about the availability of technology and just because there is a system available, you know, would you go to that just because it was there? And I think that's one of the where UPLC has fitted into the story a little bit. It can give so much, much, much faster, you know, uh, chromatographic systems. Um, and if you're developing, you've got a lab and you're looking to where you want to be in five years and you want to be doing improvements like that, you know, maybe maybe say, well, if I'm going to redevelop the method anyway, why wouldn't I develop it to be really fast and really accurate and get a whole bunch more sensitivity? But if your lab's the kind of lab where you're taking in methods from all sorts of places, the equipment you've got is almost all HPLC, you're not really going to replace all that instrumentation in the next five years, then potentially just looking to stay in the world of HPLC, but still getting the best improvements that you possibly could is a choice. So again, it just depends where, what kind of lab you have, what kind of equipment fleet you have, and what kind of um, uh, opportunity you have to really take advantage of your HPLC or UPLC in the future for all of the methods in your lab. It's a trade-off, again. So uh, next up we have, what other tech, te pardon me, I'll start that again. What are the test parameters uh, that need to be verified when the method's being changed from HPLC to UHPLC? So I'll start with this question. Um, so first of all, if you're not, if you're transferring the method and keeping the same column and mobile phases, um, then you would just need to verify that you met system suitability um, performance. But um, when you change your method or you're redeveloping or scaling from HPLC to like sub two micron, um, especially if it's a gradient method, so that's where it would basically be redeveloping. So you won't be able to verify it. If you're, as we showed before earlier, and it's an isocratic method, right? And you're just changing um, the, L, the particle size, um, but you're keeping the L over DP ratio um, and scaling the flow rate in the injection volume, you would need to verify those method conditions that would be impacted by that. So you might want to, you would have to verify obviously things like linearity or any other sensitivity or any other criteria that you think would be would be impacted by those changes. Um, and that's really what verification um, involves. Heather may have a few more comments on that. Yeah, I remember a chart that was in an old USP ages ago that said for for you know for this kind of method, these are the things you should have, you should check, and it was kind of a checkbox thing that you would decide which which checklist you had to work to, and then you would just read off the verification limits that are there. And it reminds me a lot about the you know the ICH guidances that are coming out are talking a lot about risk based. They're talking about looking at validation as risk-based and looking at computer system validation as risk-based. And also, we want to be able to look at method verification and validation as risk-based. So if you're making a change that you know is going to seriously change life sensitivity, then your limit of detection is going to change. You're going to be able to go much lower with your tests. So those are the kind of tests that you would want to put into your verification. Um, and they're the ones, you, even if you're doing a full validation, they're the ones that you're going to have more weight on them. So depending on the changes that you're making, um, you know, if you're making a new method where the selectivity is different, then that's a whole different type, a different kettle of fish. You may really want to be looking at tailing and, and resolution in that case 
as part of your verification. So I guess it's, it just depends on what if you had to change and going from HPLC to UPLC as well as particle size, what else did you need to change? And as Paula said, if it's a gradient method, you have no choice right now um, but to revalidate that method until those, that new version of Chapter 621 comes out, which will explain what changes you need to verify if you're making a, a change to a gradient method. We've got just about enough time to squeeze in a couple more questions, so I'll try and uh, read these out quickly. Uh, what is the best resolution between peaks that you can get, and when is it necessary to separate by peak valley? So I'll start with this one. The best resolution, obviously, you want it to be greater than 2.0, which will allow you to integrate um, repeatability, repeatably those peaks. Um, so any resolution greater is better. Uh, so I know that in some um, chromatograph techniques, such as like SEC, there may, you may not be able to get that resolution. So that's where you can use Peak Valley. Um, in reverse phase chromatography, I think ideally you really want to try to get that USP resolution greater than 2.0. Um, so I'm not really sure how often that is used in um, monographs for USP. No, I don't know. I don't. Uh, finally, we have, when do we expect to see allowable adjustments for gradient methods in USP 621? This is, this, we've been waiting for this for so long, Paul, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, we, really th we really thought that this fall, this September, in this issue, that the that, that those allowable method, uh, changes for gradients would be there. Um, it's, it's really important that this is harmonized globally as well. So there are still discussions with the, with the European uh, pharmacopoeia and the Japanese pharmacopoeia which haven't come to a conclusion, which means that that can't be part of the September USP update. Um, it's possible if you only deal with the US, it may be possible to include um, peers to do gradients and it may be that September issue has some national text that says this, this is allowable but only in the US. Um, but I'm not sure if that if that's going to make that September um, publication either. So I think really we're looking to allow those gradient changes in a, within allowable changes is not going to be until sometime in 2021. Thank you both once again for answering all of our questions and for the great presentation. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thanks to everyone online for joining us. If you have any other questions that you haven't asked, please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I'll follow up with these personally. Uh, remember, you can also download a certificate of attendance from the documents tab on the left side of your screen. If you'd like to listen to today's webinar again or invite a friend to listen, it'll be available to watch on demand in a few days time. Goodbye and thank you all once again for joining us.